it's time to begin because we have one cat who has decided to join us and she is here to give us permission to commence our operations. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. We have a really great guest who's written an important new book. And I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. One of the ways we've been thinking about information technology and information in the academic setting has been in terms of scarcity. Uh, for millennia, uh, human civilization has dealt with a scarcity of books, a scarcity of people, a scarcity of communications of being able to reach people who aren't near you. Then starting with Gutenberg, then accelerating with literacy in the 19th century, and then really taking off with the internet in the 20th century, we are now covered in information. We are drenched in connectivity. The question is, how do we change higher education as a result? What does this mean for teaching and learning? And here in the forum, we've been thinking about versions of this question for some time, but today I want to join uh, an expert to us. Uh, this is Dave Cormier coming to you from Ontario in the only Canadian city that is south of Detroit. Uh, he's the author of this excellent new book right now, uh, Learning in a Time of Abundance. And the subtitle itself is a provo provocation. The book is delightful. It's really accessible, very thoughtful, and it all reflects lifetime spent of trying to think through teaching in the digital revolution. So without any further ado, let me welcome our guest, put him up on stage, and we can meet him. Hello, Dave Cormier. Hi, Brian. Thanks very much. <clears throat> that was a lovely introduction. That was really, really nice. Thank well, you. You're welcome. It's completely deserved, and I have a lot more that we can say. Um, uh, just, just so you know, you have fans in the chat room. One of them already said, let loose rhizomes of learning. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've probably told you I'm a longtime Deleuzean, so this makes a, a lot of sense. Yeah, to me. absolutely. Dave, first of all, where are you today? Where have we found you? I'm in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, uh, which again, as you say, is south of Detroit. I'm in my basement um, mm -hmm. and uh, I've just come back from dealing with an aphasia conversation where we're building nice open resources, which is what I do at the um, University of Windsor. I'm a learning specialist and uh, my title says digital strategy and special projects meaning i do random things <laughs> from one day to another excellent excellent yeah. um well it's good to, it's good to find you in your lair um That's right. and, and i have to ask what's the what's the weather like there uh it's 10 degrees and sunny wow. yeah no so uh, windsor is um uh, it's kind of like the I, I, it's like a banana peel belt I wouldn't say banana because that gives you the sense of ripe fruit that it'd be tasty. So think banana peel. It's the banana peel belt of Canada. So it's it's actually quite warm here a lot of the time. The weather's quite temperate. Oh, yeah. Um, I moved here from the East Coast and we get three more months of cycling weather here. Not wow. Norman cycling weather, like normal person cycling weather. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. No, no, I, I, I lived in Michigan for quite some time, as, as you know. And uh, yeah. about March in Michigan, I usually expect, uh, you know, some more ice, some more snow, some more freezing. But not here. You get to slide in that banana peel. Well, oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Listen, Dave, when uh, we invite people to the forum, uh, we ask them to introduce themselves in an unusual way. Uh, mm -hmm. Academics often use the uh, academic obituary style of talking about you know, everything they've done. <laughs> but what we'd like to know is what you're working on for the next year. So both you know, materially, what are the projects, those special projects? What is the stuff you're working on? Mm -hmm. And what are the ideas that are uppermost for you for the next 12 months? So um, I've just, uh, it's funny you say that because I've been working with a lot of professional programs lately and we keep coming across the same thing. My kids aren't ready to get out to, to work. Um, law program, social work, kinesiology, education. And so something we just started, is called the uncertainty community. And what mm -hmm. we're looking at is trying to come up with ways of addressing professional programs in ways that allow them to talk a little bit more about uncertainty and a little bit less about facts and processes and stuff like that, which are not, it's not that they're not important, but the oh, challenge okay. that they're all seeing, and it's the exact, it's so funny because you see them, we'll get in, I'll pull them in together in meetings and one person will say, oh yeah, but in law, you don't have this problem. And the people in law will be like, we totally have that problem. Mm -hmm. And it keeps happening again and again. And so we've got this sort of community that I've tried to pull together where we're going to start asking questions like how do we prepare students for uncertainty and not in that weird future jobs kind of way mm -hmm. not like for an uncertain future where 66 percent of the jobs won't exist like not that thing but like almost a daily uncertainty so a good example is um 
if you're a law student who's just going into a law clinic, what does that first interview look like? Because what they're seeing very specifically is the law students are going, so what should I do when I get in there to my interview to talk to the client? And the person who's supervising goes, I don't know. I, I don't, your, your job is to go in there and find out. Yeah. And that sense of uncertainty is something that's a real challenge for them. And we're trying to look at different ways mm. of building the process. So that's, that's the big sort of goal for me in the next year. Wow. Really? I mean, so, I mean, you, you emphasize uncertainty in this book. So mm -hmm. now you're, you're really carrying it out beyond the pages of a book into practice for, for law and education. Yeah, that's the idea. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Jim Stauffer in the chat says, I'm a recovering certainty addict, <laughs> which is which is very good. Um, definitely some of that going on. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask you to start things off uh, a couple mm. of questions uh, about your work. And then everyone in the audience, uh, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, now, if you haven't had a chance to read the book on the bottom left corner of the screen, you should see a big kind of tan colored button it says learning in a time of abundance. And that's that'll take you to the Johns Hopkins University Press book uh, page where you can buy a copy. Um, so you can really uh, rely on that. But also you'll find that uh, Dave is just a fountain of ideas. Um, and so as he answers my incredibly uh, kindergarten level questions on a graduate school level level. Why don't you take a, um, you know, think about what you'd like to learn uh, from him and what you'd like him to address. Um, I mean, so one thing I, I want to ask you about in the beginning of this um, is you have this really, really nice line. Um, here's the problem. We were not trained for a world that had too much information. We were trained for a world that had too little information. Our ways of thinking about the world have prepared us for the scarcity party. We are the nouveau riche of the information management set. We have all the wealth and none of the aplomb. Um, and, and this is this is beautifully said, by the way. Um, and this needs to be a tattoo on somebody. Um, <laughs> but I, I wonder, what, what have you seen in higher education of mm -hmm. academics actually trying to learn and apply lessons of abundance what are what are some of the examples would the the MOOCs for example which you're associated mm -hmm. with their birth would that be an example or the open education movement I, I'm, I'm just curious I mean change is always complex where are you seeing the seeds of change and the first responses to your question um I would point to the open pedagogy movement um not oh. open pedagogy and the open educational resources that I use in my classroom but rather an openness of my pedagogy. Uh, so Catherine Cronin comes to mind. Um, so walking into a classroom, not necessarily knowing what's going to be worked on that day, because what I'm looking to do is help you deal with the abundance you're going to find whenever you ask a question and sort of transfer my own skills as somebody who has more experience in this field. And, and you, you made uh, reference to the, the subtitle of the book, Community is the Curriculum. To me, it's it's about inviting you into the community of people who know how to talk about this field, who mm. understand how to make decisions in this field. Yeah. So that open pedagogy community will say, I don't necessarily know what we're going to learn. So if you think of mm -hmm. uh, the work Kathy Davidson has done on mm -hmm. uh, uh, learning contracts, where you open up the design so that you're able to allow students to do discovery, but also provide enough scaffolding so that when they run into something, you can provide them with sort of the, the level of expertise that they need to be able to make decisions inside of whatever they're finding. And to me, that reflects the experience that most students are going to have whenever they leave the classroom. And not just for work, but when they leave classroom and decide how to handle their home heating. As mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. end, that's a very important conversation. Mm -hmm. like, like my environmental impact, the financial, like these are complex situations that we deal with in our lives. We certainly have them in our professions. But in our lives, and if we treat in knowledge as something that is fixed and decided, because that's the easiest way to maintain scarce knowledge, then that doesn't prepare us for doing a Google search right now for how I should heat my house, which will give you, a, I can't even imagine what you'd get randomly the yeah. first time you did that Google search, but you're going to have to go through it. You're going to have to learn things. You're going to have to find out about the impact of the electricity on your local grid, like there's all kinds of intersecting conversations. That's a long answer to your question. Well, no, but this, this is great. I mean, so on the one hand, you're starting off with the open teaching and um, so open education, not in the sense of OER, but in the sense of uh, of sharing this right now. Um, 
Uh, Lee, um, I, I hear you're on Amtrak. Uh, that's awful uh, in terms of connectivity. Um, uh, please, uh, if you want, switch over to your phone on the Shindig mobile app. That that might be uh, might be more reliable. Uh, I know the Amtrak Wi-Fi all too well. Um, but Dave, you start off with, by talking about uh, open education, and uh, mm -hmm. among other things, it makes me think of of educators sharing their work with each other as well as uh, opening this up to their students. But then, the community as the curriculum is such a fantastic phrase. Um, it is so so rich, and here you you're giving a, a whack at one part of that. Uh, mm -hmm. where students are welcomed into a community of practice and a community of knowing uh, yep. rather than just uh, being allocated uh, a certain part of the curriculum. I, I, I think this is just uh, fantastic. <laughs> Allocating a little bits, you know, little, little bits of this. Um, Even worse, what we do is this. We show it to them and then we hide it behind our hand and we go, remember what was behind my hand? Can you tell me what I just showed you yeah. a second ago? Yeah. Yeah. Or we take the uh, the acetate um, um, display and we cover up parts of it and reveal yeah, it. That's right. That's right. That's um, right. Yeah. In your, in your conclusion, um, you have this wonderful chapter that everyone should just take away with, um, which is, you know, what we should do and how we should live in this world. Um, and you have all kinds of, of wonderful uh, recommendations, uh, starting off by practicing humility, which you really do mm -hmm. in the book. Um, I mean, oh, as, as an authority, you, you, you come across as very humble, very accessible, uh, very human. Um, but I do wonder about the, the pro-social web. Um, okay. I mean, I immediately agree with this. Um, but I, I, for reasons of space, you only had a couple of pages to talk about it. But yeah. how, should, how should academics now advocate for and practice the pro-social web? I mean, is this something where we should be turning to uh, more open software like WordPress? Should we be avoiding uh, proprietary platforms like Facebook or uh, TikTok? Uh, should we be escaping the LMS at long last? And what, 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 is the, what does the academic pro-social web look like? Wherever would we go if we left the LMS, Brian? I know. Um, yeah. So a couple of things I want to say at the beginning. First of all, this can only go in response to the amount of privilege you actually have. If you're a contingent faculty member, you're somebody from uh, mm -hmm. often racialized groups, particularly racialized women, uh, racialized people, uh, binary, non-binary people, LGBTQI, like those people are not in the same position to do things on the open web that an old white dude can get away with. And I just want to make that that claim right off the bat that working in the open can be risky for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, I think my personal position is to stay unless the places are um, amazingly egregious my position is to stay in the spaces as much as we can because as we leave spaces behind they get increasingly populated by um bots and bad actors and commercial groups and stuff like that so to me we any platform that is making knowledge in our society is one that we have a certain responsibility to within the scope of our privilege um and i think as academics people who like I think, and I made this argument, <laughs> and particularly faculties of arts lately, um, we're about epistemology. We're about making knowledge. We're about like those sort of core ideas culturally. And I think that we need to be able to go to those spaces where information is distributed and knowledge is being made and do our best to bring our values to those spaces. Um, and I think that's part of our responsibility as people who care about information who care about knowledge um so that's that's how i feel about it and i think yeah. the more we can understand i think the and the book talks a lot about this but um the more we can get into the habit of deciding with our values and interacting with our values because yeah. we haven't had to as much particularly as you stay I mean, you imagine culturally as you go over and you know, i love the introduction in terms of the way you, you talked about abundance over time I think it's the same with values over time. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. If you live in a small community and no one leaves that community, no one needs to talk about the values of that community, right? You don't have to negotiate them. You may not like them. They may not be fair, but everybody knows where they are. Um, as we start to cross over, as we become, as our cultures start to interact, you are suddenly confronted with the conversations that are uncomfortable, that are outside of your experience and that we're not trained to that, right? So I remember you mentioned MOOCs earlier. I remember in the first MOOC, um, we had 
uh, Viplav Boxy came to us from, he was in Delhi at the time. Mm -hmm. And he showed up, and I think it was the second week. And he came into one of the conversations and he's like, man, this is so global north. Like, I can't even, the, the pieces of this you guys are missing. And he went on to explain his position with respect to the thing we were talking about. And as those experiences continue to happen, you can either retreat and entrench, or you can open yourself up to consider how your values impact these situations. And I think that's the real mm. challenge. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, you just had me looking to one of the practices that you advise, which is uh, um, focusing more on our values, and uh, and you don't do that in a cheesy way. It, it's it's a very heartfelt and very practical, which I I, I really admire. Um, in, in the chat, you've got all kinds of commentary. People are razzing you. People are running yeah. different directions. Uh, our mutual editor and good friend Greg Britton says he'd love to take a class with you. I think we all would. Um, Tom Hames is showing stories. Um, but we did have one question, which is a uh, pushback from a fellow uh, French Canadian here. Um, uh, Mathieu Plourd asks, mm. are we back to EduPunk circa 2008? Jim Groom, anyone? Because uh, you know, some of us have been talking about open education and open yep. uh, teaching for quite some time and the open web. Totally. Um, how, how do you respond to uh, your, your, your dueling connect? Uh, I wouldn't trust that Jim Groom guy with anything. Um, um, that's my first response. I think, uh, Jim is one of those guys who's done, if you guys aren't familiar with Jim Groom's work, he's done uh, good work everywhere he's been. Um, I've learned a lot from Jim over the years for sure. Um, his work, particularly with, with Brian Lamb, there's a period where the two of them were tag teaming a little bit. And I think there's a, there's a way of questioning the education field that I certainly adapted to some degree from, from learning from, uh, from Jim. Um, I edgy punk is, is a funny thing, right? So it's counter it, in it being punk, it's counterculture. And there's been 17 references in the chat to rhizomes. And I just want to address that for two seconds. I wrote a bunch of stuff about rhizomes. Uh, and you can like, if you do a Google search of rhizomes and me, you'll find it. And if you need good nap material, it's probably there. This work is about, it's still in there. I don't say, I don't think I say the word in the whole book, um, but it's still in there. It's just me trying to come up with a way of talking about the things I used to talk about in deep, dark, postmodern language and put it in a way that somebody could enjoy reading it. And I won't say knowledge translation. I won't say dumbing it down because that's certainly not what I mean. But it's an attempt at taking a storyteller's view at that mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for me, edgy punk is a is a resistance, whereas this is my attempt at trying to call out the things that everybody already knows and just cast it in a story that allows you to see it from a different perspective. That's a really, really nice way of putting it. Um, you both mentioned Jim Groom in the chat. I quickly tossed in a, a link. Jim was actually the eighth guest on the Future Transform. That's not uh, true. Way, way back, way back. Um, thank you for uh, for that answer. Um, the uh, We have questions coming in. So I was about to invite the audience to put questions to you. Um, and they've already just started putting them up here. So I just have to get out of the way and, and share them with you. Um, here's a, a really good one, which uh, touches on a subject that I think we both care a great deal about. This is from Elaine Lazda, University of Albany SUNY, who says, where do you see librarians fitting into open pedagogy and supporting information assessment, literacy, et cetera? How do academic librarian faculty partner with instructors? Do instructors even want our support? Mm, so how do question. librarians fit into all this? I will, um, I'll tell you the, the, about the project I'm working on with a librarian right now. Um, so we're talking about, so this librarian, um, supports a lot of students who come in with assignments with uh, like, let's say essay writing, uh, where they don't know how to start. So he's the research librarian that helps students do that kind of work. And it turns out that increasingly students are coming in, um, I want to put this in, in the, in the best way possible, um, task oriented. I have a task. I just want to complete the task. Give me the quickest path between here and there. Yeah, yeah, and they're coming in with challenges that they don't necessarily understand, and so they don't. They're being asked a the answer, answer asked to answer a question for which they do not have the context. So what a what mm. he would have traditionally done as a librarian, which is tell me what you're interested in. The answer is blank, and the answer is no. And so what we're looking at is trying to find ways to bridge the gap and getting the the information that the student needs contextually 
to be able to ask a research question to the student? And how do we interface that conversation? We're talking about, um, I, I know this is going to sound super revolutionary, using Wikipedia, um, but also uh, talking about how some of the AI platforms can help you get that basic knowledge that you need to be able to ask the question to be able to do the research. So I think there's a there's an information management challenge here that is, uh, I mean, this is the bread and butter of the library as far as I'm concerned. Not just how can I get you to a book, obviously, which I'm sure there's no librarians who just do that anymore, but how do I get you to understand amongst this abundance enough mm -hmm. of the pieces, enough of the, the sort of hooks that get you towards people who have seriously and, and seriously worked through this, not the people who are trying to sell you something, for instance. Now you're gonna navigate your way to the beginning so that you can then move along, right? That's a, that's a first of all, it's a very pro library uh, answer and a, and a very detailed one. Um, I, Elaine, I, I hope I hope that works for you. And if, you, if you'd like to follow up with the questions, either you know, click the raised hand button or, uh, or follow up with another, another question. Uh, you've got some very, very good uh, discussions actually about Wikipedia. Um, and I, I wanted to mention one of them because it, it, it was uh, something that's very dear to my heart, which is that um, uh, you, you mentioned, I'm going to paraphrase, that uh, Wikipedia gives you a sense of knowledge, not as a finished product, but as something that's contingent and, and in the process. I love uh, showing students the talk page uh, yeah. of the article just because it's so messy. And, and, yeah. you know, and argumentative and shows things in, in that kind of process. Well, we have we have more questions coming in. And, and friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a Q&A question. So feel free to click that question mark button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, our dear friend, much abused, uh, Tom Hames, uh, has another question. Uh, isn't the key variable in an age of information abundance perspective? Should we be teaching people perspective of learning how to learn? Sorry, perspective as part of learning how to learn. Um, can you follow up on that, Tom, and tell me what your your sort of meaning by perspective there? I wouldn't want to get you the wrong way. Yeah, Tom, uh, please think of a couple of interpretations of that. I just want to make sure I get yours. Yeah, uh, feel free to type in another response, Tom, or to uh, just click the raise hand button. I can beam you up on stage. Um, the uh, well, oh, and he immediately volunteered because he knew he knew I was going to pick him <laughs> and put him up on stage. Yeah. Hello, Tom, in the blue room. Yes, in the blue room for a change, back back in the home digs, um, just for one day at least until the summer hits. The uh, no, the question I have is that uh, um, one of the things I've been working on as far as dealing with the questions of information abundance is this idea that the pro the biggest problem with information abundance is loss of perspective that we only see small chunks of it at a time as human beings. We have trouble processing it. We have lousy tools for gaining perspective on things. And I think that's a role that education plays, should play, but often doesn't. Because what ends up happening is that a lot of times in classes, we give people a people, like you were describing earlier, you know, hide it behind your hand, right? Yeah, exactly. And so we give people that that peephole view of our, uh, of our, of our discipline, but also on top of that, the discipline on top of uh, the, the, the discipline in, in, in isolation from other disciplines as well. And so, you know, one of the things that I think we have as a result of information scarcity and the industrial. Uh, did Tom just that? Do... Nope. You're back. Did now. I freeze? Yeah. You're back yeah, now. Back okay. Now. Yeah. You so the, information the, scarcity, and then the information. I mean, we're used to an information scarcity in the industrial environment, which led to ever increasing specialization, and and so the 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 the, the name of the game was to go do deeper and deeper and deeper down rabbit holes of, you know, scholarly inquiry and stuff. And at a certain level, that's fine. But for you know the general undergraduate population, they don't necessarily need to know this medieval de poet debating the with this medieval poet kind of stuff uh, as much as I think a lot of times they get, you know, fed. Um, not to pick on that, my father is a medievalist. So. I see. I was going to say <laughs> uh, there has to be a story there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But um, the, um, but it, you know, I think the, um, uh, but the question I have is, shouldn't we be teaching people to be able to 
learn how to generate perspective? Shouldn't we be giving them tools to create perspective? Because I don't see another way of getting over this question of information abundance. So if, if by perspective, like it's like the context to be able to decide. It's um, a map, right? A, a real map as opposed wow. to a Google map, right? We're back to rhizomes again. Um, yeah. So um, I'll describe, I'll, I'll answer with a description of something that I teach in class and we'll see if it, if it, so one of the things that I absolutely, cause I teach bachelor of education students right now and it's, I love teaching BS students um, and I teach them uh, learning styles. So for those of you in the room, probably about six or seven of you just flinched. Um, but the idea of learning styles from a cognitive science perspective is absolute nonsense. And yet in the K-12 school system, it's almost religiously observed. And so we have this huge um, sort of separation and I love it. it it's, it's beautiful for teaching. So what I do is I get them to go in and do a search for, I get them use, uh, we used um, BARD, I think this year, but give me a lesson plan to teach two by two multiplication to students using learning styles. And so whatever system will just give it to you and then you get it. And then they showed it around and we talk about it. And we talk about the relationship, the kind of search they make and what kind of results they get. And then I say, okay, now put hate in your sentence somewhere or mm -hmm. are evil or whatever, some negative word. And then they do the same activity and they're like, the whole room freezes. And they're like, but I mean, we just, and then, and I'm like, okay. And so inevitably I, I let it settle down and inevitably one of them goes, which one's right? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> and then we get we get into it because right in this case it's just a question of your perspective on it so right. inevitably somebody who believes in learning styles will say well if they're learning uh oh what's the word that people always use if they're learning preferences then it's fine so really that's all we're talking about hmm. whereas the scientific people will say well there's no brain reason why this works and somebody else says well it puts kids into pigeonholes and they come up with bad habits and then all this conversation goes around the room and then eventually they're like well what are we supposed to do and i'm like it doesn't matter to me um my goal here is to give you enough of an understanding of this so that if you're ever in a conversation you yourself are going to take a while to come up to decide what you feel about this and i don't i'm not telling you to listen to the cognitive science community and i'm not telling you to listen to this community what i'm trying to give you a sense of is what the community discusses and so we say the community is the curriculum i want to bring you into the conversation so that you mm -hmm. have a chance to see enough of the pieces that are there not so that you can decide because i don't think it's fair to ask a 21 year old who's seen this conversation for the first time to decide how they feel right about it. exactly but rather give them the tools that they need to understand that there's a conversation give them yeah. a sense of so this researcher who hates learning styles let's take a look at them for a little bit and then they start digging in they're like this person's super biased and i'm like they're inevitably they're like i thought research was unbiased and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but it's understanding all those pieces so that they get a sense of that conversation and and be able to engage in it right so one of my students at the the end of one of those classes he looks at me and goes what if i think of learning styles as like a celebration of the senses and i'm like sounds fantastic take that away with you Hmm. Um, but to me, that's the that's the navigation we got to help them through as, right. as instructors is here's all of the things around this thing. And more importantly, here's how you navigate something so that you can understand that there are different perspectives. You can understand where those different people's perspectives are coming from. Right. Are, are, do you think we teach navigation enough? Oh, absolutely not. I, yeah. I don't think that anything has impacted. Uh, I'm going to be overly dramatic here, but anything has impacted our society as much as search has. And mm -hmm. we've had this same problem for 20 years and yeah. we're still not doing the work we need to do with it. If you look mm -hmm. at the way an average student does research right now, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm going to say we were younger, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pointing at the, th the three people, I'm not making any claims, but all of the fuzzy faces in the chat room, but just the people I can see on top here, <laughs> um, we had to go through cue cards yep. and go through the library and read 25 things before we found one thing that we could use mm -hmm. to actually write something. Yeah. yeah. All of that reading around, that's the mm -hmm. actual learning process, the exactly. context building, the understanding yeah. of the field. Mm -hmm. When I talk to PhD students now, I younger PhD students than me, um, I'm like, they're like, well, no, why would I do that? All I do is I go to Google Scholar, I put in my search question, I find an article, I control F through it, and I find one link, I copy and paste it. That's what you've asked me mm -hmm. to do to support my argument. Right. 
They don't read sometimes not even the quote they're copying. Probably not the paragraph that's contained in it and definitely not the article that it's there. Right. Yeah. And it's search that's done that to us. Yeah. It's allowed it so that you can do what used to teach people how to do something like write an essay and turned it into a task that um, Darcy had made the made some nice language about this earlier. It turns it into a task that's just about obedience. Mm, right. Yeah. Just you're just mm -hmm. Sisyphus pushing the rock off the hill. Mm, that's all you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I've written entire articles about books that I found next to the book I was actually looking for. <laughs> Just like, you know, like, oh, this is interesting. Let's go down this rabbit hole. Okay. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Tom. As usual, you ask the best questions. Thank you. Uh, friends, if you're, again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So if you'd like to join us on stage, please just quick click the raised hand question. Um, and, uh, and in fact, we have another one, uh, which is good because I was hoping to ask her about this. This is our wonderful friend, Lisa Jenny, uh, Hinchliff. And she asks, let's see, do we have her? Yes, we do. Where are you, Lisa? I'm at home, believe it or not. Oh, wow. <laughs> good, to you. good to see you. Thanks. Yeah, so I typed this in the chat, but uh, mm -hmm. so just in just for other people who don't know, spent 25 years as an information literacy librarian. Um, so I, I have to say, I I feel Dave, you might have a little bit of a the good old DAs in your comment going on there because I'm thinking back to the work I was doing when students were doing all of this in print. And they were certainly looking for that one key quote that they could just copy in. They weren't necessarily reading the whole printed article, et cetera. So always a little bit of a challenge of, of uh, remembering the, the good students and maybe not knowing what students were doing in the library if you weren't seeing them. But I was the worst student. I was doing what you're talking about, yeah. but I still had to scan those articles to get yeah, to the again, I... all the world of difference between scanning and like I, I've got to get there somehow. Like, and you yeah, can go to the back of the book and go to the index. Yeah, and yeah. I, I I hear you, and I'm still saying I think it's a, I, I think there was less engagement there than than you might hope. But it could be that I just have seen a bigger range of the curve, and that even though you think you were that student, there's a few more down on the curve. But that's actually not my 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 question for you. Uh, my question for you is: It strikes me that one of the challenges with these gotcha pedagogies. And I'm not saying you're trying to trick your students, but where you're like, okay, now put the word evil, hate, et cetera, right. in, and you get this moment, right? Like you get this moment of like, oh my gosh, and destabilizing their world. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially what you're doing is you're trying to take them out of a state of naivete into a state mm -hmm. of knowing. Mm -hmm. But the real, to me, danger in that moment is that you inadvertently tip them into cynicism. Well, there's no, there's no truth. It's all just your opinion. In fact, somebody put it, you know, in the, the chat here as, um, you know, uh, you know, what's right is just your perspective, right? It's all just opinion. So yep. I'm wondering what pedagogical strategies you're seeing or thinking about that move people out of naivete, <laughs> but then protect them from moving into cynicism. Because honestly, I think we were better off if I... I mean, even as info librarian, this this is worries me of what I've done in my career, right? Like, were we are we better off with naive than cynical? And on some days, I think yes. Mm. Mm. I hear you. Um, I, at first, I think the the keystone to all of this is trust. You can't do the activity I just did fairly if there's no sense of trust, and you also can't do it if you've already decided what the right answer is before you start. So I legitimately don't have an opinion on learning styles. Um, I've read all the stuff from that I've been able to find on both sides, and I, I don't think it matters a whole lot whether or not it's true or not. Um, so I'm not setting them up in the sense that I have, and there's, because there's two ways to run that activity. If you do it and then the right answer is hidden, <clears throat> then you're breaking trust. If you do it and what you're saying is, I've introduced you to something and we're going to expand this conversation, if you already have a trust relationship with that class. I mean, you can't have a trust relationship with every single student, like I get it, but you need to build your way up to that, to the point where people have a sense of how this thing progresses. You start with things that are um, less tightly held. And so it has to have that gradual release of responsibility piece to it, right? Where you start with things that are not as contentious and you move your way towards things that are more contentious. 
Um, so all of those things are like the pedagogical approaches that are built into that. Um, I think to, to your broader conversation around cynicism, um, there's absolutely no one who needs to teach a 17 year old how to be cynical. Like, <laughs> we're starting from cynicism. We have nothing to do with that in a university structure. Um, I have uh, spent an amazing amount of time in the last five years. So especially through COVID, I had 80 different um, co-op students work with me because they couldn't get other jobs and they were forced to work with me. Uh, so there weren't people who chose to work with me. There were people who got stuck with me. And we spent a lot of time. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, and I've told the story a dozen times. So if anybody's heard before, I apologize. Um, but I was in the middle. We're a week and a half into, into working together. And these are, like I said, they're my employees. And one of the kids, um, sorry, one of the young people I was working with uh, went, look, I, I just need to stop you for a second. I need to apologize to you. And I'm like, apologize to me. Nicest kid too. Nicest young person as well. And I just, I didn't, I did, could I idea where, they, where it came from. And he goes, you've been asking me for my opinion for the last week and a half. And I assumed you were lying. Because no adult has ever asked me a question without already knowing what answer they wanted. That's the place that they're starting from, right? So what I'm trying to do is build a classroom environment where their opinions actually have a place, right? And these guys are going to be teachers. I mean, there's no place where you're doing more freaking micro decisions than sitting in a grade five classroom. You're making them all the time, especially there because you're you're teaching everything, right? So I'm trying to get them to the place away from that cynicism that they're inheriting from this abundance world that they're in. Um, I think that I had a great deal of the naivete that you're talking about when I went to university, for sure. I was a, I was a kid from the North Shore of New Brunswick from a town of 350 people. I grew up on lobster boats. Um, I had a lot of that. These kids don't. There is no 17-year-old kid who hasn't seen every atrocity available on the internet, who hasn't seen like all of this stuff they're absorbed to already. I'm trying to bring them back from that place. So, so what I just heard you say, though, doesn't sound like cynicism to me. It sounds accurate, right? The student who says an adult has never asked me a question without already knowing what they want, that actually sounds like what you actually have posited is wrong, right? Like that, that student actually isn't cynical. They're correct. And then they're applying that to yours. So that's not an act of cynicism to me. That sounds to me like an act of saying, like, based on everything I've experienced, this is the way the world works. I'm having a dissonant moment that, um, and I'm saying like, I'm sorry, I assume, like I, I applied my mental model. I mean, it's, not, I mean, or are you positing that indeed their, their curricular experiences up to that point were actually adults asking them truthfully in the way you are? I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's not wrong if that is actually what's been happening to them. That's not cynical. That's accurate. I don't think cynical is wrong, though. I think you can be cynical and be right about it. Um, I think they're being cynical about anything that I'm asking them and they're being and they have good reason for feeling that way. Um, what I'm trying to do is give them a sense that when they're dealing with intellectual ideas, that they that the question what is your opinion about this is legitimate, like, like that I legitimately mean it, oh. which puts you in a grading nightmare, right? Because mm -hmm. we're still forced to give number grades inside of my school. Right. So I do effort-based grading, I do contract grading, all kinds of stuff to try to twist myself out of the way of putting them in a position where there are right answers to some of the questions. And again, I'm not a relativist. I'm not saying that there aren't things that are wrong. Right. I'm saying that in most complex conversations where mm -hmm. the topic of the conversation is a non-counting noun, um there are multiple ways of approaching it that's mm -hmm. not to say that there aren't facts there are lots of counting nouns out there um but anyway yeah i don't want to over yeah i guess that's part of what i'm trying to figure out is like how do you make sure that they see that there's still all facts right that that the the, the sort of thing you're trying to draw out of them which is mm -hmm. reasoning around and about facts um doesn't mean there aren't facts right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm seeing in a lot of um, that 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 facts are just the pieces of data you can find to support. And so that just re right. So that's what I'm trying to grapple with, which is mm -hmm. how do we do exactly what you're talking about? The sort of thinking around and about facts with mm -hmm. a in such a way that doesn't lead them to the there are no facts. I mean, I think that's why we need to talk about like 
how knowledge is made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Brian and I both have written about complexity for years. Mm -hmm. And when we make the distinction between something that's complex, uh, a complex, so you look at uh, the Riddle and Weber stuff from 1971, mm -hmm. still one of the best articles I've ever read. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the title's weird. A general, it's the Wicked Problems article. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where you end up with a, a topic that has no way of framing a proper question. There's no way of getting to an answer. Those issues need to be seen as complex without real answers. What's the answer to poverty? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we don't work on it. Right. But I think the real cynicism comes in when you think of wicked problems as if they're fact-based problems, as if they're design problems that you can solve. I think that whole design conversation gets us into trouble too, because so often the way that it's deployed, not that it's always done this way, mm -hmm. but it's deployed in a way where the design idea is to get to the answer, mm -hmm. right? So that engineering model, like I was in a, a meeting, oh God, seven or eight years ago in government mm -hmm. where uh, people were telling us to run our healthcare like Lululemon and fail fast. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you, don't, you don't fail wrong fast. Model. Wrong, wrong model. <laughs> wrong model. So wow. they have facts about their success. They make money. Mm -hmm. And the more money they make, the better it is. Healthcare is just not that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Are there facts in healthcare? Of course there are. But mm -hmm. do we know what a healthy person is? Mm -hmm. That is <sighs> and I think it's important for us like in, in my case, talking about students who are going to be teaching students to understand the distinction between things that are facts and things that are about the way that you apply your decision making to very difficult things that don't have exact answers. Mm -hmm. When you do that, it's not the relativist thing, which is what gets fired at me all the time. It's not there are there are definitely wrong things, but there are several right things you could probably try. Mm -hmm. And you may want to try one and realize that it works for one group and not another because that's teaching. Well, I appreciate this. Well, thanks for letting me tussle with you a little bit over this. Awesome. Um, it's, Thank you very much. I've really been thinking about a lot, this whole question of cynicism. And mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that cynicism is a very pernicious force in um, the way it's destroying communities and civic life. And so I just really have been struggling with sort of how do we, how do we conceptualize not furthering that while at the same time doing the, the pedagogical things we think we should be doing. So appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Always good to see you. And we appreciate that question very much in the conversation. Um, friends, we have, uh, we're coming up in the last 10 minutes and we've got some questions left that we haven't gotten to yet. So I want to make sure that you still have a chance to uh, ask your question. Um, uh, we have one, Dave, a few minutes ago, you, you were talking about Google search and a few people in the chat uh, went off in different directions. I think Greg and Darcy were talking about microfiches, uh, microfiches, oh, yeah. um, and it was uh, it was very very interesting. But here's a, a question that 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 spins off of that. Uh, what do you think of the effect of the inclusion of AI content in search engines on the challenge information abundance? Does this change what we should do? And that's uh, Jason Green at University of Arkansas Pulaski Technical College. Uh... Yeah, I'll put that back up. Trying to remember her name. She is the researcher who was fired at Google for talking about AI. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if somebody could put her name in the chat room, because I'm referencing her right now, but I can't remember her name. Uh, I have I have pieces of it, but it's I always get the I want to get the pronunciation right. Anyway, I'll, if I don't, I'll find it in a second. She would say that the biggest challenge we have is increasingly AI is going to create the content that AI is going to be sourcing. Right, so the further we get down this road, the more that content is automatically generated based, based on our existing language models, everything continues to narrow, right? So um, I like to call it the, the sort of auto-tuning of knowledge. Mm. Right? So you, you lose all mm. of the all of the nuance, all of this, and it just starts to get narrower and narrower as AI draws from AI to do AI tasks. So I think it's terrifying. Um, and this goes back to the other conversation. Oh, stochastic parrots. This goes back to the other conversation you're asking earlier about the responsibility of academics. Wow. And I think that there's also a responsibility to lay your name next to your work in a way that allows people to find those kinds of things. Uh, it reminds me of what Larry Sanger was trying mm -hmm. to do with the first Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So those of you who don't know this um, boring old story, um, Larry Sanger worked worked at Wikipedia, and he was working on something called Newpedia. 
And the goal of that was to bring together research ideas from researchers on important topics. And they threw out this thing called Wikipedia to try to just train the software. And you'll remember how that went. Um, but I think that that sort of collection of of work that has that's been vetted and, and sort of it's going to become more and more necessary. I've been doing a lot of work lately with faculty trying to do um, annotated bibliographies on very specific topics to try to bring together um, a bunch because a lot of people have these, but they're not public. And I think that if you've got somebody who you have identified as a researcher that you respect, having the list of articles that they've gone through and talked about gives you that way of getting around an AI, uh, the way that searches work and whatever else. It gives you another way of actually accessing the information. I think, I hope, I think at least that that's the way we're going to go to address a lot of those issues. Hmm. Okay. If, if, if you're going to, if you're going to throw us back into the past a bit, uh, it reminds me a bit of, of um, social bookmarking tools going back oh, yeah. to yeah. and delicious um, or uh, right now, I mean, I, I use Digo and Pinboard. Um, and that's a, it's a way of kind of showing your work um, in, yeah. in, some, in some interesting ways. Uh, in, the, in, in the chat, Elaine uh, Lonsdale says, we used to call them pathfinders in, in libraries. And Darcy Norman takes us even further back to blog rolls. Um, and Mathieu also uses Digo. Good for you. Good for you. Wow, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you triggered a lot of stuff on, on, on that question. Um, so first of all, thank you for the answer, Dave. And Jason, thank you for the really, really important question. Um, I think we're going to keep coming back to that. Uh, we have another question, and this comes in from Mike Walker at North Central State College in Ohio. Uh, and Mike asks a question about another, another spin on teaching in this way. Uh, is there still a future for on-the-ground classrooms versus a model that a few have pioneered of pop-up leasing of space as labs situated in the community? bring up resources for retraining faculty um so that's the 12th century parisian model of universities mm -hmm. i like it mm -hmm. um can we get the little tonsured hair too so that we can't be arrested while we're doing it that'd be awesome oh no, oh, no. um so <laughs> um so i i think that universities right now are mostly carrying i don't want to make claims about universities in front of brian frankly because uh, he knows way more about this conversation than I do. Um, but we're still in a branding conversation, right? It's not about, universities are not about teaching. Uh, they can be, but they don't live and die on teaching. They live and die on whether or not kids choose the brand and actually pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that any of those other models are going to impact the way that a university actually runs, right? I mean, it's an incredibly complex organization. Um, with all kinds of archaic rules and, and very important rules, uh, some of which help us stitch together a community, some of which get in the way. Um, but no, I, I don't think we're going to see a lot. I think we're going to see the same thing that Brian keeps tracking, right? Which is important institutions lose important parts that people don't understand um, what value they serve inside the organization. And we'll see uh, universities that Brian lo loves close. Sorry, Brian. Um, and I think we'll see um governments doing drastic dramatic things that are not necessarily going to help i mean uh, i i don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole but we're 60 years into a conversation around higher education being something we pay for and an increasing sort of drive towards making it expensive so that fewer and fewer people go wow. and that pushing against the fact that more and more people wanted to go mm -hmm. and i think we're going to see that push start going back the other way as it just becomes financially impossible for people to do now you're more of a problem in your country than mine but yeah i mean I'm, you're you're saying that from from canada which has a, a higher degree of, of support except you're in ontario which where the government just decided to clobber the international student population uh, which is uh, going to be a, a horrible thing for you uh, to bear. well and and the 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 secret text there is that the reason why we had to have so many international students is they continuously cut our funding. Um, so it's two phases, right? And so um, there are certainly some governments on some part of the political spectrum who are better served by this historically. Um, and we see that pattern continuously developing and it's troubling. 
Well, let, let me try and pull this out of that um, uh, out of that hole, or as um, as as Lisa Durf says, she's expecting a Mad Hatter at this point. Um, the, let me let me ask you to imagine what would happen to a campus where everybody reads your book. <laughs> and, um, a lot of naps. <laughs> well, well, maybe maybe some maybe some beer drinking, but uh, but, right. but they're all influenced by this. So the the, the faculty, the uh, administrators, um, the students who are interested, the librarians, the technologists, all the support staff. Um, what is what does a college and university look like, say in five years of following your ideas? What a fascinating question. Um, so one of the things I talk to my students about is organ sorting your values and then making decisions accordingly. So mm -hmm. I, for instance, would say that I want a student to like math more than I care if they got the answer right um, Ooh. in a Ooh. grade five math class. So my argument being, if you like math, even if you got it wrong, you might be willing to try again. Whereas getting it right doesn't mean you're ever going to do it again. Right. So it's about, so if the, the sort of the, the, to me, the core message here is about treating students as if they're humans. <laughs> and uh, just imagine for a second, and then focusing on care first and foremost, right? And there are a whole bunch of conversations around how that happens. To me, the outcome of this is even if you wanted to teach in the way in that sort of objectivist, hide the hide the word sort of, it's not going to work anymore. So I, I feel like we're past the point of the argument about whether or not instructivist or constructivist models of education are going to be paramount. The instructivist models along the way that they've been done for uh, a century are no longer going to work, right? So we've got students right now who are now handwriting essays in class inside of universities because that's the only way people can maintain the models they had before. Um, to me, the only way to get a student to do work when they're not being watched in 2024 is for them to care about the work that they're doing. So t in my mind, five years into this, you'd have 28.5% of your conversations would be, how do we encourage, how do we create an environment where we're encouraging students to care about the work they're doing? Because if they care about it, and I don't, you're not gonna get all of them, not all the time, but if they care about it, they can engage with the work, right? And they might do the work at home. And they might learn stuff because they're actually interested but that's not the model that we have and we could punish students into doing the work before and now we can't so we start with this radical idea of treating students as people and, we, <laughs> I know. and then we and then we, we push the idea to make them we care for them and we help them care for the subjects mm -hmm. I, I think that would be a deeply humane uh, campus and a, a, a deeply powerful place to to work and to learn. Um, I, I've, I hate to say it, but Dave, we're we're out of time. We're the uh -huh. end of the hour. That's too uh, bad. It's been great. The, the chat is going is going wild. Um, uh, Darcy, you asked about an AI pen. Um, here, I got one for you right there in the chat. Um, so let me let me let me ask you because people are now going to go crazy and they're just going to run Greg Britton out of all copies of this book. Yeah, it's the bottom left copy of the book. Uh, what would you, what's the best way to keep up with you now? I mean, is your blog really the best way? Or, uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would have said Twitter. Um, sadness. Um, yeah, I, I think the blog is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, okay. I mean, people are welcome to my email address. So I have no problem handing it out here. Oh, thank, um, you. thank you. But um, yeah, my blog is still up and running. It doesn't get as much love as it used to, but I'm still good for six posts a year almost. Okay. Um, Some great stuff there. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Pedagogies of care, indeed. Um, well, in, uh, in, in that case, uh, I don't want to carve out any more of your, uh, of your afternoon than we already have. Dave, thank you for being an inspiring, thoughtful guest who has just wowed us all and uh, given us so much so much to think about and to implement thank you thanks very much brian thanks for inviting me thanks for being uh, thanks for bringing the hard questions too i really enjoyed it well it, it's That's our good. please take care and, and and be safe take care folks
But don't go away yet, everybody. Uh, just if you'd like to keep talking about this, um, about Dave's work uh, and the ideas that come today, everything from AI pens to treating students as people, we can keep talking about this online if you'd like elsewhere on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky, or on my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, uh, including uh, well, where we've hosted some of the people who have come up in this show, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. If you'd like to think about what we're doing next, uh, take a look at these topics that are coming up. You can find them on the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And above all, thank you for the thoughtful questions. Thank you for all the great ideas. Um, it's, again, always a pleasure to think together with all of you. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're safe and sound. And we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.